Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Marines, Book 3 in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2018. Stand by for a priority message from Skywatch Command. The Starships universe kicks off with Starships at War, my five novel series featuring the adventures of Captain Jason Hunter and the Bandit Jacks. Starship Expeditionary Fleet is the seven novella sequel story of the Battleship Argent and the build-up to the Second Praetorian Interstellar War. Destroy All Starships is series number three when the Human Core Alliance of Worlds and the Dragons of the Starn Star Empire launch thousands of warships into a devastating conflict that will decide the future of the galaxy. Sixteen titles and more on the way. We're making it all available in ebooks, print books, and our all new audiobooks. No DRM, no apps, no compatibility issues, instant delivery. Hours and hours of entertainment. Car, home, gym, at the beach, anywhere, anytime. Any device that can play audio can play my audiobooks and nobody can beat my prices. All you have to do is remember one web address, shane.lachlan.black. That will take you to the get a book title of the day where all our best deals can be found. It's continuously updated, so bookmark and visit often. All ahead, battle speed. Chapter 19. Assault Cruiser Revenge CA-220. Bayoni 3 Interdiction Zone. Commander Patrick Enright commanding. New contact. Designate Atlantis 12, bearing 290 degrees range, 11 million miles on intercept course and closing. The crew of Revenge was still in the process of organizing a rescue of their fleetmate Exeter when the signals section lit up. The SRS bridge officer verified the readings and performed a threat analysis. Course is consistent with a Blackburn transit, sir. Estimated time to intercept 27 minutes. Commander Enright swiveled his con chair to face the forward navigator's console. Straight through our own jump gate. Exactly what Jace was worried about, he muttered. Signals. Open a priority secured channel to Argent Force Command. Authorize all relays. Include our log entries and tracking for the last six hours. Note last known positions of Constellation, the 808th and Exeter. Notify Captain Hunter. I believe a first strike on the Bion system will commence in the next ten hours. Affirmative, Captain. Coding your message. Bosun, signal all decks. Sir, all frequencies are down. Subspace and loss transmitters are offline. We are being jammed by Atlantis-12. Either their timing is flawless or they knew what we could least afford, Enright muttered. Set alert condition 3. Tactical battle screens to maximum. Helm, take us out of orbit. New course 60 Mark 171. All ahead flank 2. Bridge crew members responded snappily to each of the commander's orders. Moments later, the bristling profile of the menacing assault cruiser banked out of the planet's magnetic field and began accelerating into open space. Enright's jaw tightened. The pit in his stomach ground away at his sense of honor at leaving any possible survivors behind in the Exeter wreck. But his duty to protect Bayon III and the thousands of defenseless civilians on its surface took priority. Revenge needed more open space than most warships to fight at her maximum effectiveness. The commander knew better than most the danger of having his main battery proximity weapons too close to an atmosphere in the event of an all-out exchange. Revenge was one of the oldest ships in the Perseus line, designed before many of the advances that had given rise to new classes of warship in the Rhode Island and Fury molds. Her plasma cannon were first-generation guns with massive heat sinks and relatively short range that relied on unstable charge loads to produce devastating explosive force on impact. Revenge was also the only ship under Jace's command with the ability to overload her weapons. In the hands of a skilled captain, such firepower amplified the effectiveness of Fury's escort cruisers considerably. With the bit in her teeth, Revenge could credibly match even Argent's gunnery in certain assault profiles. Although the Citadel-class Havoc guns had half a dozen firing modes and far longer range, when it came to sheer destructive force at closer assault ranges, there were few Skywatch vessels that could compete with venerable heavies like DSS Revenge and the other Dragoon-class cruisers and their variants. Captain Enright also knew his single ship would be completely outmatched if Bayon 3 was, in fact, the strike point for Atwell's attack. 
In orbit, Revenge was not only a clearer target, but was totally unable to maneuver in the event of a multi-pronged attack, or the sudden appearance of cloaked vessels, or a few of Hunter's fabled picadors. Tactical, do we have an emissions profile on Atlantis-12 yet? Negative, Captain. The battle comp is working on it. Enright thumped his fist against his chair arm. Is the contact turning with us? Negative, the navigator said. Contact on course for a high Bayon-3 orbit. Notify Black Queen Revenge recommends she declare Aegis Protocol. Start the clock. Negative, sir. I can't pierce the interference in system. Enright muttered a curse. Navigator, I need to know if Atlantis-12 is a single, and I need to know now. You've got 60 seconds to get me an emissions profile or we're flying weapons hot into its teeth, battle group or not. Working, Captain. Helm, plot an intercept course. Maintain speed. Chapter 20. 14th Infantry Garrison. Bayon 3. Lethe Deep's Perimeter. Major Daria Komanov commanding. It wasn't often human beings witnessed a 300,000-ton object moving at 14 miles a second surrounded by a fusion-powered electromagnetic force field in a planet's atmosphere, but for those on the ground within a thousand miles of Starhaven, that's exactly what was slicing through the sky at an altitude of more than 140 miles above Bayon 3's surface. The Starship Exeter's navigational auto systems were still in operation and had managed to slow the vessel's out-of-control port roll to a manageable rate, but the destroyer's engines were completely out of commission, which meant there was no way to significantly alter the ship's course. A ghostly faraway light strobed and lit up the jungle floor in all directions, stopping Sergeant Alexander in his tracks. He watched quietly as the trail of fire soared over his position and disappeared beyond the tree line to the east. He briefly considered breaking radio silence to help coordinate a rescue, but ultimately decided against it. Realizing his personal ability to assist the 14th would involve transiting possibly hundreds of miles from his current position. It would have to be left to Komanov's garrison, as she would be much closer to the crippled vessel's impact point, and would have the personnel and equipment to locate the ship and rescue her crew. It just so happened Komanov herself was standing just outside her base perimeter and carefully tracking Exeter's course. She had a pair of sophisticated range finders and was using them to gather what data she could. She also had the vessel's disaster beacon and quickly assigned her SRS section to the task of recording Exeter's exact impact point. Report. Aye, ma'am. Vessel will impact in four minutes. Current projected location will be 71 miles off the Starhaven Zone's eastern coast, near the Windward Island chain. Do we have a look down in that region? Komanov snapped. Negative. The closest is SATCOM 7. We can redeploy and get a high-resolution pass on the next orbit in 40 minutes. I need a look down in five minutes, Corporal. Sorry, ma'am. We can't do it with satellites. Very well. Get the crews to the gunships. I want them powered up and ready to scramble launch immediately. I'll have two SX-12S ready to move with them. Redeploy SATCOM-7 as our backup. I want to know exactly where that ship first touches the surface, and then I want to know its location moment by moment until she's on solid ground, underwater or other. Affirmative? Hi. Transmitting scramble orders now. By now, Exeter's smoking hull was corkscrewing through the clouds over the garrison's location. Flaming pieces of wreckage were streaming through the air around it. Komanov could only guess what was happening inside Commander Pierce's pitted, scorched ship, or what would happen if she hit the Eastern Ocean at speed. Given the physics involved, the most favorable outcome, if there was such a thing, would be for the vessel to graze the water at the shallowest possible impact angle in order to skip across the surface and potentially use friction with the ocean to slow down before a more significant impact. The disaster scenario would be if Exeter hit at a high angle. The energy discharge of an object that large going that fast would be bad enough. The fact Exeter was packed from bulkhead to bulkhead with weapons and fusion piles only made it worse. Her battle screens and drive field would mitigate the damage somewhat, but ultimately they would end up being the match put to 300,000 tons of what might as well be tightly packed hydrogen bombs traveling at Mach 65. The resulting detonation would likely vaporize several hundred cubic miles of ocean water, which could create an even bigger problem for the farms and fields to the west of the ocean. Danger was doing what it did best, multiplying on itself. 14th Infantry had minutes to respond, if that. Exeter disappeared into the cloud cover east of the garrison. In moments, it would pass below Kamanov's horizon. The Major whispered a curse and ran for the alert center. 
The early warning board lit up in the garrison's operations complex. A moment later, the overhead voice channels activated and echoed through the halls and control rooms. Alert response officer, this is Skywatch. Clear all frequencies and stand by for an emergency action message from Black Queen. Acknowledge. The Marine A.R.O. flipped two switches and picked up the handset at his control station. Affirmative, this is alert response at timeout 3-4 mark. Standing by to copy your message. Acknowledged, A.R.O. Now hear this. Now hear this. Scramble all alert spacecraft. Repeat, scramble all alert spacecraft. Respond to Skywatch on deployment frequency SATCOM 7. Ground targets on the board. Bearing 99 degrees. Range unknown. The alert response officer picked up his handset and calmly activated his combat radar systems. Moments later, he brought the garrison STC matrix to full readiness. The internal power systems of all four gunships were warmed up, system checked, and activated at 5% power. Rotating yellow lights snapped on at various points in the hangar. Assault Wing Command, I have a valid emergency action message. Combat launch orders confirmed. STC is standing by. The pilot's barracks exploded in a storm of screaming alert klaxons and strobes. Nearly two dozen crew members leaped from chairs, racks, showers, couches, and even a weight room to sprint for their flight gear lockers. Not far from the garrison, two of Kamanov's prized SX-12 recon trackers abruptly pivoted away from their patrol stations and accelerated down a gentle grade toward Starhaven's western perimeter. Within moments, the two agile little vehicles had reached more than 70 miles per hour and were soaring over hills and bouncing their wheels off broken rocks as they raced to follow the fiery disaster in the sky over their position. Both trackers reported to the garrison's alert center they had scanner locks on the spiraling starship. Using what orbital resources they could, they immediately set up a network of tracking stations and began working on the problem of projecting Exeter's impact point. But even with their considerable ground speed, it would be some time before they could reach a position on Bion's surface from which they could render any kind of practical assistance. Inside the vehicle's chassis, the noise of its engines and hydraulic suspension systems roared like an avalanche. Alert response, this is Wolfpack 6. Engage ground telemetry reception on SATCOM Net 7 and stand by to receive position reports as they become available. Acknowledge. The ARO added the two trackers to the telemetry net and authorized their position reports throughout the network established by SATCOM-7. Moments later, the combined data from three satellites, the garrison radar systems, two trackers, one Razorback tank, and an unidentified aerial probe far to the west of the SX-12 position, all had DSS Exeter's impact point located. Komanov's gunships had 40 seconds to break the starship's horizon, or it was going to be nearly impossible to find its resting point, even if they did manage to pinpoint where the destroyer went down. Chapter 21. War Destroyer Exeter DDX-8043. Bayon 3 Atmosphere. Lieutenant Commander Alvin Pierce commanding. A teeth-shattering explosion ripped through Exeter's bridge. By now, most of the officers were either strapped into their crash harnesses or holding on to one of the emergency tethers for dear life. All but two or three had blacked out by now. The ship continued spiraling, causing violent G-forces that prevented those that were still conscious from reaching the controls they needed to stabilize their course. The forward viewer displayed a vertigo-inducing high-resolution view of the pale sky turning around and around. Another barrage of whispery plasma blasted down the egress corridor and ripped the last of the debris from the magneto lift entrance. Corporal Henderson Byers ducked behind the pilot's console and caught the eye of one of the bridge officers. His jump pack boots were magnetically anchored to the deck plates. Without them, he would have been battered unconscious by now. The pressure release sensors in his combat suit were the only thing keeping him from passing out from the gravitational force. Using crude hand signals, he got the young, petty officer's attention. Byers couldn't be sure, but through all the smoke and sparks, he thought he saw an engineer's rating on the man's uniform. The Marine Corporal hoped the petty officer knew what to do if he gave him the chance. Byers nodded towards the navigational console and then indicated he would help the young man get to it. The petty officer glanced towards the egress corridor, then back to Byers. He nodded. Corporal Byers changed the setting in his boots from anchor contact to momentum contact. With three heavy steps, he moved from one side of the console to the other. Using mime-like hand signals, he encouraged the petty officer to detach the lock on his harness and hold it with his arm instead. Once the young man was free and able to leave his station, Byers held up his hand and counted down with his fingers. 
five, four, three, two. The Marine exploded from cover and launched a conch round down the corridor. The unstable plasma bolt filled the bridge with bright light before disappearing into the smoke. An instant later, Byers fired a plasma bolt into it, causing an overload reaction and detonating the round in the lift hatch. The bulkheads and controls shuddered again as the explosion thumped and another blast of hot debris scattered across the deck. In the instant that followed, Byers physically lifted the petty officer out of his crash couch with one arm and placed him at the navigation console. He was now in the line of fire, but Byers was standing right behind his control panel with his formidable weapon aimed directly at his would-be attackers. The petty officer rapidly laced up the shock harness and locked himself into the navigator's crash couch. Commander Pierce coughed and struggled to turn far enough to see the Marine. His valiant attempt to save the ship was their only chance. Report! Altitude now 16 miles. Estimate impact in 84 seconds. Engage Navicomp and re-entry sequencers. Authorization Cougar 7559. Enemy weapons fire angrily flashed out of the magneto lifts, tearing energy-spitting gouges in the bridge ceiling. One bolt impacted the communications bank. Sparks showered down across the controls. Byers ducked and rose again. A rapid-fire barrage ripped through the smoke. The shriek of energy impacts echoed. Despite the fact he might be vaporized at any moment, Petty Officer Darren Murphy quickly acclimated to the reoriented layout and activated the navigational computer. The main data banks were down, but he was able to quickly engage the auxiliary system. Exeter's maneuvering system accepted the command uploads and the computer engaged what was left of the enormous ship's thrusters. I have a power failure, sir. We're down to one auxiliary reactor. No response from engineering. A black-suited enemy fighter appeared in the main hatchway and leveled a heavy-looking weapon at the navigational console. Corporal Byers snap-aimed and fired at a range of perhaps eight yards. Two rounds punched into the attacker's chest and threw him back into a pile of torn and burning metal. His weapon clattered against the hatch. All engines and thrusters back full. Maintain power to drive field and life support only. Acknowledged. Stabilizing course on Axial 4-1. Three minutes to impact. Sound collision. As the bridge lights shifted yellow, the leading edge of the heavily armed warship began to glow as the vessel's hull started cavitating inside its own drive field again. The electromagnetic surface of the powerful shell around Exeter began to ionize atmosphere as the ship hurtled through the sky. The trail of fire rapidly became a soaring pattern of electrical discharges and rapidly accumulating clouds. In a matter of seconds, the ship herself was obscured in an expanding field of crystallizing water vapor and atmospheric ice. With the assistance of the maneuvering thrusters, Petty Officer Murphy managed to orient the ship's roll angle relative to the Bayonne 3 surface at an altitude of just over 21 miles. The drive field fluctuated as the internal systems worked to adapt to the frantic changes in atmosphere density, water content, and temperature. A mighty sonic boom erupted from the clouds, strobing across the eastern continent and water's edge as the war destroyer plunged towards the ocean. Partial engine power restored! Murphy shouted. His voice was barely audible over the roar on the bridge. Corporal Byers had his weapon trained on the egress hatch. For now it appeared the attackers were regrouping. All back full, Pierce shouted back. Set pitch to plus five relative. Get us down to 500 yards per second relative velocity, maximum altitude. Affirmative. Murphy fought to hold Exeter's course as Byers sidestepped heavily across the cluttered and damaged bridge to the main hatch. He held his rifle muzzle up and began working the security controls in an attempt to seal the bridge off from the rest of the ship. Forward velocity now seven miles per second and slowing. Pierce resisted the urge to breathe a sigh of relief. There were still a hundred things that could go wrong with this little excursion into a planet's atmosphere. While frigate-class vessels like Minstrel and Ajax were capable of intra-orbital flight modes and ostensibly capable of landing on a planet's surface, Destroyer hulls weren't designed for the kind of gravitational stresses and atmospheric pressures that resulted from amphibious operations. Exeter's assault boats, of course, were capable of transiting to just about any location, surface or otherwise, but the mothership was designed to operate in space. Re-entry, operating a drive field in an atmosphere and using ion-type engines through a planetary magnetic field, were all theoretically possible and had been attempted by far more experienced scientists and spacecraft designers before. Based on the available results, such flights were not recommended except in the gravest circumstances. 
Murphy brought up the vessel's navigational profile. Exeter's number no. 5 engine was still operational at roughly 70% capacity. The rest of the ship's main drive was dark, and the special systems display indicated no damage control parties were available. That last bit of information sent a chill up Murphy's neck. Where were they? Was the bridge crew all that had survived the initial explosion? Byers succeeded in configuring the security system. The reinforced blast door slammed over the main hatch, sealing off the bridge. A moment later, the vessel lunged as her drive field exploded through a miles-wide pocket of unstable turbulence. The crew members who were conscious held their shock harnesses tighter. Position report, Pierce shouted. Altitude now 12 miles, forward velocity 4 miles per second and slowing. It seemed to the commander his ship just might halt its perilous descent before impact. He started untangling himself from his shock harness. If the G-forces on the bridge subsided, his plan to get to the pilot station just might succeed. Now that the attackers attempting to take the bridge had been temporarily blocked, he would have time to right Exeter's course and possibly get her back into space. Altitude now 9 miles, forward velocity 3,600 yards per second and slowing. When velocity breaks 500 yards per second, bring us to station keeping at maximum altitude. Aye, standing by to... The bridge lights went dark as the shock of a huge explosion rocked the entire vessel's structure. A secondary went off moments later, causing all the control surfaces on Exeter's bridge to flicker. The tactical console flashed, spewing sparks and composite debris into the air. The engineering bank went dark. Emergency lights, Pierce shouted. Manual operation. A stark glow was restored from a single LED in the aft section. Long shadows covered the floor and consoles. There was just enough light to illuminate the con and the forward consoles. The rest of the bridge was either submerged in shadows or completely dark. Engine 5 is offline. Velocity increasing. Station-keeping thrusters are overloaded. I can't hold altitude. Configure forward battle screens for maximum depth. Set our defensive systems to absorb as much of the impact momentum as possible. Stand by to engage fire suppression systems. All personnel engage emergency life support. Impact in 25 seconds. Chapter 22. Tarantula Hawk Assault Wing. Bayoni 3. Starhaven Protection Zone. Lieutenant J.G. Maxwell A.B. Commanding. Four fully crewed gunships continued their ascent over Komanov's Iron Keep garrison. Each pilot was seated forward of his or her commander and three crew specialists. With the precision any knowledgeable observer would expect, each spacecraft maintained its perfectly synchronized position in a standard diamond combat formation, resembling the attack profile popular with Wildcat squadrons and their flight leaders. The difference here was the T-Hawks were twice the displacement of even the heaviest cat, and their drive fields were tuned to fully support a wide variety of devastating firepower. ASO, this is night fever. All wings report full-spectrum combat readiness. Engaging interstellar drive fields now. Requesting instructions. Affirmative Command Wing 5. Vector 098 for ground targets. Your signal is buster. I say again, your signal is buster. Acknowledged ASO. Vectoring 098 for intercept. Time out 40 seconds. Black Wing's lead gunship banked towards Starhaven in sync with her three squadron mates. Reaper 8, the Black Parakeet, and Shadow Waltz maneuvered in formation with their flight leader. The Diamond Formation dove low over the northern fields as it moved towards the unidentified ground contacts along the eastern coast. The trailing gunship locked its sophisticated targeting systems on Exeter and added itself to the SATCOM-7 data net. With the assistance of Wolfpack-6 and one of the far-off communication satellites, Reaper-8 calculated Exeter would impact the surface of Bayon-3's largest ocean more than 200 miles offshore. Fortunately, the warship was no longer headed for the Windward Island chain, but the offsetting problem was the further Exeter got from shore, the harder it was going to be to effect a proper rescue. ASO, this is night fever. We are tracking six unidentified hostile ground contacts bearing 116, range 45 miles. Request permission to arm. Major Kamanov grabbed the remote handset. Command 5, this is Black Queen. You are cleared to arm. Get me an ID pass if possible. Affirmative. All wings accelerate to attack speed and break formation for combat intercept. Lieutenant Abi's lead gunship banked to port as Reaper 8 and the Black Parakeet dove to starboard. A moment later, the formation broke 20 miles and started angling back towards the coast. Threat board! Hostile transmission sensors went off aboard all four vessels at once.
The jangling tone sounded in every crew member's helmet. Engage panic reactors. Get me a targeting solution. Three gunships rocketed over farms and buildings, causing apocalyptic sonic booms that shattered windows and threw debris skyward. Black Queen, this is Black Parakeet. Battle Computer reports Sarn armor and mobile anti-aircraft batteries at coordinates 558 by 1673. We are being targeted for range. An alien vehicle parked behind a rocky outcropping less than a mile from the beach swiveled snap quick and rapidly launched nine ground-to-air rockets at the oncoming gunship. The missiles instantly registered six-point weapons locks on Black 7's flight track and accelerated to more than three miles a second closure velocity. Black 7's commander saw the combat telemetry and calmly ordered overload power to his forward screens. Punch through, pilot. Stand by your countergrav. All nine enemy missiles slashed in on divergent vectors. Half-mile-wide bursts of fusion energy thumped along Black 7's track, buffeting and rattling the angry vessel's screens with white-hot bursts of fiery destruction. Hundreds of tons of earth, rocks, trees, and sand exploded into the sky. Seven screens absorbed several million watts of energy from the impacts and poured it into the gunship's panic reactors. Divert all power to weapons! Seven roared out of the barrage and sliced low over the mobile SSPM battery. The sound of the drive field blasting through the Bayown atmosphere slammed into the rocks like an oncoming train hauling 100 freight cars full of cement. The SSPMV's left side wheels landed back on solid ground a moment later, but by then the black parakeet had swerved back far enough to bring her heaviest weapons to bear. The gunship banked out of her turn and roared forward into a frighteningly precise strafing run. Fire! Seven opened up on the SSPMV's position. Oval-shaped bolts of unstable plasma punched into the ground like white hammers. The ground shook and finally erupted into a trailing, violent fountain of flaming debris. The warship screamed overhead, leaving behind two half-mile-long craters and a 90-yard-wide fissure in the rock formation. Enemy vehicle screens are down! The SSPMV launched again, this time with five rockets. The tiny missiles tore through the sky, following Seven's drive field signature. For a moment, it looked as if the Sarn birds might score a direct hit, but the enemy ground commander wasn't ready for Black 3. Shadow Waltz broke weapons range on a zero-degree axial and came in on the SSPMV's position at an impossible altitude of less than 40 feet. By the time enemy fire control recognized the threat, it was several seconds too late. Multiple rounds punched through the vehicle's armor like cannonballs through a fishing net. Its power plant detonated with a violent blast, tossing the 60-ton vehicle into the air like a child's toy impaled on a column of fire. The secondaries from its remaining warheads vaporized most of its chassis before pieces of what remained rained down on the beach. Meanwhile, a Sarn armor company had crested a hill scarcely four miles downrange from the destroyed mobile surface-to-space missile vehicle. Black 5's battle computer caught their scanner signatures first and transmitted their designations to her three wingmates threat boards. The Skywatch computers identified the units as Sarn Mark VI medium battle tanks, codenamed Hoplins. Black Queen, this is Night Fever. Sarn armor units confirmed. Repeat, Sarn infantry is down on the surface approximately 19 miles from the Starhaven protection zone. Five's commander gave the order to reconfigure his gunship's weapons for screen disruption. Black 7 and Black 3 hovered into position a few hundred yards off the crest and locked their weapons on the enemy formation. The Sarn opened up first. Guided by overhead targeting drones, their main batteries flashed and thundered, rapidly filling the skies with mile-long lances of plasma energy. Disruptive strikes immolated the forward screens of the two heavily armored gunships. White-hot energy began to burn the ground for hundreds of yards in every direction as static bursts caused uncontrollable lightning to spider across the sand. Seven began to stagger under the unending firepower, skidding back against her own engines as the fires of vengeance raged around her. Finally, Shadow Waltz returned fire. A rancorous bombardment of cannon fire smothered the rightmost elements of the enemy column. Dozens of bolts, each the size of a railroad car, pulverized the ridge itself, throwing rock, sand, and all manner of debris into the sky, where secondary explosions blasted it all over the battlefield. The Black Parakeet joined in, launching an even more devastating hail of cannon fire into enemy armor and their formidable battle screens. The sound of the explosions roared out over the oceans and shattered the ground for miles in every direction. The Sarn tanks drew from auxiliary power sources and increased both the intensity and rate of their attacks. 
the disruptive energy began to interfere with the two gunships and their targeting systems. The pilot of Black 3 responded to an alert signal on his power board. Sir, we have 8% reactor capacity left, estimating 20 seconds to failure of our forward battle screens. Black 5, this is Black 3. We are disengaged. A Sarn SPM detonated overhead. The fusion-powered shockwave hit Black 3 hard enough to nearly overwhelm her engines. Only a quick maneuver by her pilot allowed the ship to avoid crashing into the beach. Shadow Waltz veered to port and went into an evasive roll as four more enemy birds screamed from behind the Sarn armor column. Three screens barely held against the proximity explosions. The last detonation knocked out her starboard engines and Reactor 3. The gunship redlined her systems to maintain altitude and limped out of range, flying more than 15 miles out over open water before veering back towards the garrison. Lieutenant Aby's ship saw the reinforcements first. His scanner tech rapidly identified at least two of the units as heavy Sarn Seacrops class armor. Ninth Intelligence was aware of the potential for highly dangerous land battleships and the Sarn propensity for big guns, but this was the first time they had been detected in action. They were heavier than Major Kamanov's Razorbacks, but rumored to be much slower and possibly underpowered as well. Nevertheless, if his scanner tech was right, the gunship wing was grossly overmatched. Black Five to all wings break off and return to base. Acknowledged, flight leader. Seven's pilot took the risk of punching his engines to maximum and flying directly over the Sarn column. It was a bold move, and fortunately for Kamanov's limited forces, it worked. None of the Sarn units were able to redirect their weapons in time to engage Seven before it emerged from the Sarn fire envelope. Reaper 8, meanwhile, was hovering at the edge of the protection zone more than 15 miles away. Its scanners were locked on the fire-trailing hull of the starship Exeter. The destroyer had broken five miles altitude and was still traveling at nearly two miles a second. All five of Eight's crew members knew what that meant. If Exeter impacted the ocean at that speed, even with her screens up, nobody aboard would survive.